Hello everyone, how are you tonight? Part of the team tonight, as you can see, I've got my suit, uh, well, my tires off, but my suit on at least. And then Daniel Swermarker, who's the head of our trading desk, is going to be the real entertainment, coming in a bit later. We don't normally let him out to see clients, actually. Um, and we insisted he at least put on long pants today. So you're, you're quite, it's quite special not to see him in, in flops and, a, and, and shorts. But hopefully uh, we'll be entertaining you a bit tonight and also hopefully educating you a bit. I like an informal session, so as we go along, please ask questions. Don't wait for the end, and uh, and hopefully we will uh, uh, we, we, we will entertain you a bit. So, who knows what Tanstafel is? It's a famous economic term. Surely you've heard of it. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, uh, what do you reckon it is? Ah, oh, geez, I tell you what, yeah, give the man a bells. <laughs> there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Um, in fact, later on, I might show that there are two free lunches in the world of investing. So while happily we're going to uh, uh, just to, uh, impart some information tonight, I actually do need to put a little advert in at the start, if you don't mind. So rather than sneak it in later and pretend that I'm not actually doing a little bit of advertising, I'd rather hit it on the head now, and Simon can shout at me a little bit later on. But essentially, uh, Bayhill Capital... Our firm is a private client share portfolio management business. We're part of the Peregrine Group. Uh, other, you might not be familiar that much with Peregrine Holdings itself, but you might be familiar with Stenham or Citadel or Canon Asset Managers, Peregrine FX, Java Capital. There are a number of operating entities within the Peregrine Group. And we just specialize in building private client share portfolios. So these are specialist portfolios in the client's name, segregated mandates. And one of the offerings that we do take to the market is what we call our active equity portfolios. And these are <clears throat> uh, quite a, a high turnover uh, trading portfolios. They're almost hedge-like. Um, and hence the, to uh, the, title that, uh, uh, the title of the presentation, which is No Secrets and Everyone is Lying. So hopefully we're not going to lie too much to you tonight. But this is about trading strategies, what works in the market, what doesn't work in the market, and perhaps not believe what everyone says, including us by the way. Um, just uh, the advert for the active equity, the portfolios that Daniel runs. Um, we use CFDs in these portfolios. They are derivatives, and we're going to talk a little bit about derivatives in the presentation and how we apply them. Uh, and we target returns of 10 to 15% per annum. So hopefully some of the lessons that Daniel's learned over the years, uh, which he, he, he uses in these portfolios, will be of use to you through the presentation. Um, so first of all, understanding CFDs. If, if you want to sound like a hedge guru, uh, you have to just know what a, a short is and what leverage is. So I, I'm, I'm not going to say here who knows what these are and who, who, who doesn't. Uh, I was once in a presentation and I said, who knows what PE stands for? And someone in the audience put up their hand and said, Port Elizabeth. <laughs> so I, I've learned not to like sort of ask the audience questions which uh, might come out uh, uh, so making them not look so uh, so smart. So essentially, a short is where we want to profit from a falling asset price. So, uh, and you can short most things. So uh, what you do is, you, let's say you take a share on an asset and you buy it. Uh, so you, you want to sell it before you buy it. So we're going to, uh, we, it's trading at 10 Rand. Uh, we think it's going to fall in price. So we sell it. And where do we find it from? We borrow the share from someone. You know, you borrow your mate's car, you borrow money from the bank. You can also borrow shares and share certificates. There are people that will lend you uh, certificates. So we borrow a certificate, a share, we go and sell it into the market at 10 Rand. And if we're clever, uh, the share falls to 5 Rand. We go and buy it back at 5 Rand. Uh, and we've now got 10 Rand in, and we bought it back for 5 Rand, and we made a 5 Rand profit. That's easy peasy. Now, that's what we do at Bay Hill. Now, the opposition, what they do is they buy it, they short it at 10 Rand, and it goes to 15 Rand. Okay. Now, they've got 10 Rand in, but they've got to go and buy it at 15 Rand, and they make a 5 Rand loss. Okay. So, hopefully, we get it more right than wrong. That was a joke, by the way. We, we, we sometimes get it right, and, 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 we, and we sometimes get it wrong. But essentially, shorting is just selling an asset you don't have, hoping it's going to fall... Uh, uh, in, in, in price, and you're going to profit from that fall. When can it go wrong? Well, essentially, if the asset that you're trying to buy back later on keeps going up in price. So the example I use is I shorted it at 10 Rand, and the share price goes to 15 Rand, 20 Rand, 25 Rand, 30 Rand, 40 Rand, 50 Rand, 
and I can't, ma I don't manage to buy it back. And let's say I only manage to buy it back at 50 Rand. I've got 10 Rand in, um, but I have to spend 50 Rand and I've made a 40 Rand loss. So in theory, your losses can be infinite as long as that asset price keeps going up and you can't close the short. But that's all about shorting. The other, the other way to sound like a hedge guru is leverage. And leverage is just about borrowing money to enhance your returns in a portfolio. And in this case, I use the example, uh, I want to buy a million rands worth of shares. So 100,000 rands of share, 100,000 shares of 10 rand. Um, I go to the bank or I go to whoever's going to help me leverage the portfolio. I put 100,000 in a margin account. So I put 100,000 on deposit and I buy a million rands worth of shares. Now, if that portfolio, that share goes from 10 rand to 11 rand, um, if it goes from 10 rand to 11 rand, the portfolio goes from 1 million to 1.1 million. Okay, and I sell it. I've now made 100,000 rand profit. But what was my investment? It was only 100,000 that I put into the margin account. And as a result, I've made 100% return. So there was only a 10% move in the share price. But because I was leveraged 10 times, I made 100% return. Again, we get this very right at Bay Hill, but unfortunately, sometimes the opposition gets it wrong. And you can imagine a scenario where the share price falls to 700, uh, 7 rand. 700,000 rand is now the value of the portfolio. And you want to close out that leverage. I borrowed a million rand, but the portfolio is only worth 700,000. I've made a 300,000 loss on a 100,000 investment. Uh, so leverage and shorting are just ways to either enhance your return or earn return on a falling asset class. And then long, as you'll be familiar with, when you're long an asset, you just own it, wanting it to go up in price. And if you understand those three things, then you can be a hedge guru, you'll understand the world of CFDs and other things. So what can you long, short, and leverage? Anyone? What can you long, short, and leverage? Everything. Okay. I'm sure that if there's an instrument or an asset or, uh, or a currency or anything in the world, I'm sure that there's a merchant bank out there that will write uh, an instrument against that. And normally those instruments that they write there are derivatives to implement long, short, and uh, leverage in a portfolio. And the derivatives you'll be familiar with, or at least have heard the names of, are futures, options, and CFDs. And I'm not going to go into what they specifically are and, and how, how they differ from each other, but they essentially all achieve the same thing. Some have certain advantages and some have disadvantages. CFDs stand for certificates, uh, uh, for uh, a certificate for difference. A contract for difference. Jeez, I'm so used to CFD, I've forgotten what it stands for. Uh, and CFDs are typically used in uh, by most private investors when trading the market. Um, and they're what we use in our, in our active equity portfolios. So the last slide, just a little bit of jargon for you to further enhance your position as a hedge and investment guru uh, around the dinner party, uh, are pair trades. What is a pair trade? Well, a pair trade is where I take one asset and I hope it's going to, I believe it's going to go up in price and I own it and I take another asset, which I think is going to fall in price and I short it. And if I get both views right, I'm going to make a lot of money. So let's say I've got share A, which I long at 10 Rand, wanting it to go up. I've got share B, which I don't like. I think it's going to go down in price and I short it at 10 Rand. What happens? If the world pans out the way we hope it is, Hope it will. A goes to 11 Rand. So you, you buy 10 and you set it 11 and you make a 1 Rand profit. And share B goes from 10 Rand to 9 Rand. You expect it to fall in price. It does. You've made a 1 Rand uh, a profit there because you, you sell it at 10 Rand and you buy it back at 9 Rand. And your profit on that trade is 2 Rand. Now, what if you get the trade completely wrong? So A goes to 9 Rand from 10. You lose a Rand because you were long it. And B, which you thought was going to go down, goes up to 11 Rand, and you lose a Rand there, and you've now made a loss of 2 Rand. So that's how pair trades work. But the real magic of pair trades isn't in this environment. It is actually is that they, are, they will make you money irrespective of market direction if you get your relative trade right, if you make sure that if A goes, outperforms B. That's all that matters in a pair trade. So let's use this example where both shares go up. There's a rally. A goes to 12 Rand, and B goes to 11 Rand. So on the A trade, 12 minus 10, I sell it at 12, buy it at 10, I make a 2 Rand profit. 
and B, I shorted at 10, I closed the short out at 11, I've now made a one rand loss. So plus two minus one gives me a one rand profit. In this case, I still made a profit on the trade, both shares rent up. And if both shares fall, as long as B does worse than A, I'm gonna make a profit. So A goes to nine rand. I bought it at 10, I sell it at nine, I lose a rand. B, uh, share B goes from 10 to eight, because it's a short, I make a two rand profit. Minus one plus two, I've made a profit. Here's an amazing thing. I've actually made a profit on a trade. It didn't matter which direction the market went, as long as I got the relative performance of the two shares right. And what I'd call this is a market neutral strategy. It's a strategy that will make me a return irrespective of the direction of the market. And you can also have directional trades, where in this example here, I have a bit more A, a bit more long than the value of my short. And that means generally I'm going to make more money if the market rises. But I could also have a, 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 a negative view in the market. I'm going to have a, a, a directional bet where I have a bit more of the short. And if the market falls, I'm going to make some more money uh, on the short. So with that little introduction, I'm going to hand you over to the, the real star of the show. Um, and Daniel's going to take you through his views of the world and hopefully enlighten and entertain you a bit. The approach that I'm taking tonight is basically based on lessons I learned the hard way um, and what I've experienced in trading in the markets. I've been um, doing this since 93. So I've been through a few, um, I've been through a good few uh, market smacks and rallies um, and the lessons that I've learned out of it. Um, Let's just go, let's sit forward. There we go. I'll start off with the bottom line on what the stock market is. And the stock market is basically based on conjecture. There's never complete information. Um, and you can see the synonyms for it, guess, speculation, surmise, notion, belief, suspicion, presumption. All of that summarizes the stock market. It is... Yes, it's based on real industries, but at the end of the day, the price movements are based on conjecture. Um, it's not a science. Um, uh, apologies to people who studied economic sciences here. Yeah, I don't mean to insult you personally. I also <laughs> had the misfortune of taking economics as well. Um, they don't want to give me a refund. <laughs> but but if if... Financial, if economics was a science and they were responsible for building bridges and railways and that, we'll end up like this the whole time. And they'll all sit around talking about it, blaming probably the, the train itself. It isn't a science. We don't have a proper baseline. We can't make proper predictions. It's all probabilities. Um, so there, it, there isn't a science to it. It's, and it's something that every time people say, but give me an exact calculation of this or give me an exact calculation. You can't. It's a guess. Which brings me to um, an analogy that I like to, to trot out is that uh, where people say it as a science is that if you had a bunch of scientists that said, okay, we're taking the scientific method, we're going to apply it to traffic. And they sit for four years measuring the traffic, which lanes are the slowest, which lanes are the fastest, optimal times to be on the road, etc. After four years collecting the data, it's a mountain of data. They published the data. They win a Nobel Prize for the data because it was so good. They announced it on the radio to everyone. The slowest lane is actually the fast lane. The fastest lane is actually the slow lane. Peak hour traffic isn't actually at seven, but it's actually at eight. Everyone listens to this and everyone praises them and it is wonderful because the data shows that. The reality is, as everyone listens to it, and humans are adaptive by nature, we end up with this. <laughs> because everyone starts switching. Everyone switches to the slow lane. Everyone switches to the fast lane. The smart guys figure out rather take a helicopter or a bicycle. So 
this is what happens when you think you're dealing with science in markets. And with all due respect to the actuaries as well. The past, how many years, 30 years or something, we essentially were in a bull market. Everybody was a genius and everyone made money. Why? Now, apparently it's got a red button. Ah. That is interest rates in America. I've just used the US 10-year bond um, because using the Fed rate was, uh, it was a boring graph. But we had an interest rate peak in the late 70s, early 80s, and we're basically now at naught. All that created a huge amount of new money, and all of that flowed into the stock market. It's as simple as that. That's why you can look at every guru that's being touted as a guru out there and say, these guys are brilliant. They benefited from a free lunch by being long. The, the, yeah, they were bit of a blip that's where the first accident happened due to this but in essence if we were just long you enjoyed the cycle all of the data that we are seeing now and historical data that is out there is based on this period now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's next and we've got a clue what's going to happen next here's Japan now the Japanese are extremely efficient they got to zero interest rates very quickly already. Um, what I've done here is that that was their big rally in industrialization, the Chinese way. Um, and, and just on that, a lot of people are drawing similarities between the industrialization of Japan and freeing of trade with what's happening in China now and forecasting a crash in China based on this. The two are vastly different. And I'll, in a moment, actually, it's a command economy in China, and in Japan it wasn't a command economy. In China, if you default on the loan, they kill you. So they can practically do what they want. It's not going to collapse. But what you've seen here is peak there, that's about the 80% fall, and it's gone nowhere for, what's it now, nearly 10, 25 years overall. Those rallies, by the way, are about 100% every time. So there is big rallies in between. But if you were a long-term investor in an interest rate environment that's in essence at zero, you made diddly, nothing. Even if you bought, uh, and, and I just wanted to show the currency movement, the yen that's also stayed the same there because there's a lot of talk about yen needing to weaken to do the exports and rally their markets. So you can see every time they weaken the yen, the markets rally. Um, here lately, that's Abe uh, and his three arrows. I don't know if you heard about it, but so far he's shot himself in the foot with those three arrows because it's still not working. But this is the environment, the most likely environment we are heading towards. And, and that's why I also say be very careful at looking now at historical data and returns and also telling everyone lower your expectations massively. The upside is, and that's why it's great to be in South Africa, we still have interest rates that are high. They still need to get to naught before we land into this scenario. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm still quite bullish on South Africa. The fear trade. This is one I come across a hell of a lot. Um, at least every three or four years, the world's coming to an end. People phone me, where should you invest when it's the end of the world? What should I do? Um, generally, um, I, you, you listen to the person and you understand the fear. And the bottom line is if the financial system collapses, then everything becomes worthless anyway. So there is nothing really you can do. But what about gold? Everyone wants to buy gold. Japan where their interest rates went to naught, if you bought gold in yen terms, and I'm speaking under correction, in yen terms, over 25 years, you made about 300% return on gold in yen terms over 25 years. That sounds okay, but good luck going shopping with gold. So if it's the end of the world and money isn't uh, relevant anymore and you lugging around a piece of gold or gold coins, uh, first of all, you are going to get ripped off. You're going to over pay for everything. So my suggestion to people, as soon as they become fearful, rather, is buy a gun. 
The reason I say that is, is because you get the most discounts with that, mostly for free. You don't have to lug around the gold. And you can also immediately protect yourself in such a scenario. It is, I'm of course joking, um, I'm terrified of these things, but th there is no such thing as protecting yourself 100% against a calamity. You need to stop being fearful. Um, you, you really need to, at every time I've seen people do a trade out of fear, they stuffed it up and they lost money. Every time. Now, uh, people ask me, what's the right approach? Um, the, I've been in uh, many debates. Uh, they sometimes did get a bit heated and fists did fly once. But <laughs> there's a lot of people say fundamentals. And I'm sure most of you are aware of what what's meant by fundamentals. You sit and you pour over the financial statements and you ask management and you make a whole analysis. It's all still historical information and then you still make a guess of what the future is going to hold. Technicals, um, much derided, same thing. You look at historical information and you make projections of what's going to go forward. Quants, that's more my area at the moment. Um, that's just using statistics and working with probabilities and that. It works about just as badly as the, the above two. Superstition. I had clients who read tea leaves, um, phases of the moon. Uh, there was some guy who issued a newsletter out of India who something happened there. I didn't, I didn't understand it. But those guys also made money. So what is the right approach? For me, is that all of them are right. All of these methods of looking at the market causes price action. Someone looks at a graph, they see a certain price movement, they react to it and they cause price action. Same with the fundamentals. Even the superstitious people that trade on the market have an impact on price. They all impact the price. So if my advice was look at all of it. Don't be open-minded in the sense of that you have to follow slavishly one of them. But it forms part of the whole picture that's out there. Everyone, it's a behavior, it's a big animal, and there's different components to it and people react to different things. Then breaking it down to okay, a bit more in broad strokes, interest rates are everything. That determines the amount of money that will go into the system or out of the system. So you need to always be aware of interest rates. The bond market is where that's, that's the elephant. And you need to watch that one to get an idea what's going to happen on the stock market. That determines how much money will go into the system and out of the system. On that, we've seen lately um, you, you, the, the QE program in America. Everyone was, um, everyone was saying that's going to cause massive inflation and watch out and this and that. And we all heard those stories. The bottom line is all that money came through. They rebuilt uh, the balance sheets of the banks, but none of that money hit the street. It didn't go out to the general man in the street who needs to spend the money and who needs to get the economy going. It didn't hit them. That's why it didn't have an effect. So on top of interest rates, you need to see if that money goes right through from the central bank and hits the street. The second one, forecast earnings and dividends. That's where our analysts come in and they also mocked a lot, but they do serve a very useful function in that we can then look at a average of their forecast. They do analyze the companies, make their projections, and price share prices do follow the forecast earnings and dividends as they go. Not accurately, but they do that. You need to get to grip with that as well. All movements in share prices are opinions. Just because a share price moves doesn't mean there is a new news thing. That's why you get a lot. You get a big movement in share price. The phone rings off the hook and everyone wants going on. Generally, we don't know and we lie about it because I can't find anyone who does it. But most of the time, it's just on, someone's got an opinion and they're moving stock. You can never stop learning. A lot of people say, I've done it, I've taken these courses, I know what I'm in for, and usually they get the biggest beating. You're always a scholar of the market. Uh, a lot of people come to say, look at my wonderful portfolio, how many profits I've made. Have you sold it? No, why should I? It's going to go up more. Market crashes the next day, it's all gone. The only profits you've ever made is if you take them. 
it looks obvious, but a lot of people don't sell their shares because they're always holding out for the next one. Losing money. A lot of people are ashamed of losing money. They don't want to admit it. They hold on to it. They keep it quiet, etc., etc. I also don't understand it because that's where, that, that's basically where all your lessons are. And that's where you see what mistakes you've made and where you keep record. It's actually, you know, you don't go to varsity and then the day you're out of varsity say, okay, I don't want to know anything about it anymore. It's the same as that. You've paid for that. It's expensive. The deadly approach. There's a saying that we've got the guys in the market. Bulls make money, bears make money, and pigs get slaughtered. So don't be a pig. What do I mean by that? Pigs. Concentration risk. There's a lot of people. I've seen it enough times to, to actually not even bother anymore. With. In one share or two shares and leveraged. And that's it. They're going to retire in a week. Usually it's like, okay, let's make a payment plan after a week. No stop losses on leverage that I've seen as well. People take go leverage to the hilt, and that's what Jeff said earlier. You put down uh, 100,000 Rand, you've got your million Rand exposure. It starts falling. You don't care. You watch it. A week later, you're 200,000 Rand in debt. Those two things, um, you can probably have smelly fingers and sticky fingers. You can use your imagination a little bit. Don't try and pick the exact bottom in the market or the exact top if you want to short. Wait for a little bit of a turn always. Wait for evidence to go. You're not smarter than the market. Nobody is. And you need a crowd behind you. And I've, those two, bottom pickers and top pickers, I've seen the most accidents happen with that one. Always be prepared to say, I'll miss out on the first 2 or 3% or the turn or patience on that one. <coughs> Listen to tips, buy systems, and believe the experts. Uh, there's another saying that goes around. I don't know if it's still being used, but behind every tip, there's a tap. Simply what it means is, is that they, they say, listen, you need to buy this thing. You go into the market to go buy it. He's on the selling side and he says, thank you very much for creating liquidity for me. And he fills you up. I've never heard a tip that worked out. It's probably because I'm badly connected, but still, it doesn't work. Systems. You've all been, I'm sure, been exposed to people that phone you. 20,000 Rand for this system. We've got these returns and that. They don't work. The trick is as, as, as follows with that, is that if there is something, uh, I'll come to it on the next slide as well, but if there's a system that works, nobody's going to tell you about it. They're going to use it themselves until it doesn't work anymore. And that's usually where they end up. Experts talking heads on TV. They're there for entertainment. They don't know. There was a recent thing that went around with Chris Hart calling the rand to 50 to the dollar or something like that. Immediately, of course, he got quoted out of context to make it more dramatic and he's probably still annoyed. But don't listen to that. It's noise. It, it really is just noise. Um, the arrogance about knowledge and skill is of, and especially when I was in the hedge fund industry, the guys had, they, they, they are really talented people, but the egos then get to them. They're very good. They had a good year and they know everything. They do not take in new information. They don't listen anymore. Um, they've got it nailed. As soon as you shut yourself out from your environment around you, and listening to everything what's going on around you because you think you know it, you're going to get killed. The blame others, not self-aware, that is pretty um, um, obvious. And the need for rec recognition and ego gluttons. Going around bragging about winnings. The sure, and, 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 and it's happened to me personally, you feel so good, you run out of that office screaming, clothes on, shouting you've made money. The very next day, the market will come and take it away from you. Don't talk about it. Just immediately um, treat it as it's luck and remain paranoid that the market might take it away from you. Then, and, and, and yeah, I wish I could just program it into 
into people's minds there. Stop looking for the sweet spot method. I've spent 10 years, wasted 10 years, looking for that method that works. Black boxes I've written, programming them I've done. It's a lot of hours that are wasted on. There isn't a, a, a sweet spot method. There isn't a something that works perfectly. It doesn't. You basically need to sit and develop a system that works for you, that caters to your own personality traits, uh, keep you away from your weaker, uh, how can I say, if, you've, if you're an impatient person, then put measures in place that forces you to have patience. Uh, bragging about wins and crying about losses, especially the crying about losses, nobody likes to hear that one because the next person probably lost more. Um, if you find something that works, don't talk about it. I have sometimes you find an arbitrage opportunity in the market, and especially I found it when the banks were particularly fond of issuing new products, which increased their margins because people are trading in it, and they mispriced the products between the two banks. And we figured it out, and we took those banks for quite a decent ride um, until someone in the office started telling everyone else and everyone else started getting involved and the banks actually started noticing it but wait a minute and it disappeared our favorite one was um the the etfs the satrix resi sometimes someone did a misdeal in anglo-american and they shot the price down five percent and it goes in auction we know it's a misdeal the satrix resi was run with by a robot so they automatically adjusted the price down we bought the living daylights out of it it gets unsuspended and whoop, it bounces back and it was free cash. Unfortunately, people didn't keep their mouth shut about it in the office and everyone talked about it. They now switch it off automatically. Reading the news. News24.com. Stay away from that, please. Any news, it makes people miserable. That It's got no bearing on our reality there. Um, I'll rem I remember last year with um, um, Nene um, getting told to leave and that. I mean, it, it, it was a very simple action that happened. And then even three weeks afterwards, the newspapers were still running with, oh, the RAND moved because Gordon cried over something. Or the, the, it, it's noise. Just avoid the news. Keep the bigger items in, in, in mind. But the day-to-day -day news stuff, and especially... They, they are there to sell you outrage. They are intend to provoke, not inform. And this messes really badly with keeping a cool and calm head thinking about the markets. Competing, don't. Um, you've got a lot of people competing and saying, I made this much, how much did you make, how much did you make? Everyone ends up watching the scoreboard instead of the ball getting bowled at you. Just don't do that. Post stuff up rationalization. Um, it could also be called self-pity or self-flagellation. If you stuffed up and get it wrong, you walk away from it. A lot of people spend countless of days and hours thinking about it and saying, why did I do that, etc., etc., etc. If you're busy trading, it went wrong, you'd immediately just write down why it went wrong and you walk away from that one. Don't spend time rationalizing why you did it and even why you should stay in a position. There's another saying that they say, cut the pain and the pain goes away. Not immediately. Don't be a hero because only known heroes are dead heroes. We've got these statues around everywhere. They're all dead. Okay, I'll sneak this one in because they are now the bane of my existence. Um, they were a very good idea a whole bunch of years ago. They were a niche product. Um, and I understand why it was born because... Have you ever heard of anyone that stayed the number one investor, number one trader for more than, say, two or three years in a row? No. It always switches. Everyone tries to be number one because they want, <coughs> sorry, consistently high returns. You can't. It's impossible to, uh, to be number one. And it was because of information asymmetry. What I mean by that is simply that someone might have access to um, information, not inside information, but inside an information that you do not have, which gives them the edge. Now, that information asymmetry has started to disappear with the internet and different systems and that we basically all got more, more or less the same access to that information now. 
But ETFs were made back then when there wasn't that case. So what you did is you said, well, I can't beat, beat the market. I can't beat the fund managers. Now I'm just going to ride with the market. So you buy an ETF and you ride with. Initially, it was fleas on a horse. No one noticed and you rode with. And if you were lucky, it was the winning horse. The problem is it's now a horse on a flea. That's how big the ETF market has grown. It's gone so big that it, it's, and then that's why I say it's a cheap, cheap ticket on a cheap ride and it's going to be an expensive accident. And I want to put it up as a record here because fund managers and active managers, what they have done is in an index, take just the top 40. If a company does badly, the active managers climb in and they sell the share down and it falls out of the index. It automatically corrects that. Now, if everyone starts more and more shifting to ETFs, it will automatic, and there's not enough active managers left, those bad apples are not going to be taken out the index. They're just going to go up and up with the index. And eventually, you can sit with a whole bunch of zombie companies in an ETF. That's not going to work. The recent example I had was with the Satrix Divi. I don't know, has anyone here hold the, held the Satrix Divi? How happy were you with Kumba that was in there? Not entirely. So those kind of things are going to start happening more. There's even websites out there where they call it now zombie ETFs, where you can see there's probably now more ETFs than shares. They should have been a minority asset out there. I live by this. Because on the market, you need to have a sense of humor, especially with all this Brexit nonsense and the, the, the noise about it. Let's see. I'm, I wonder. Oh. He sneaked it in here. He said, I must give a few trades and that. And it will probably be the ones that will go spectacularly wrong. But uh, Recently, what I did, this is quite simply the share price of Barlow World divided by the share price of Imperial. That's it. That's the formula. And it creates an artificial share, so to speak, a ratio that you trade. If you buy... Yeah, it means if you buy Barlow World and short Imperial, you'll make money as it go there, and then that the reverse. Is anyone unclear on that? Okay. Um, this is my own, uh, it's a very simple system I've built over the years. I, I tweak it quite a lot as the markets change and the interest rate change, but it saved me a lot of grief. It's quite slow. But every time there's a, a breach, on these lines, it's, it's a volatility-based um, system, and I overlay it with fundamentals. I won't bore you with it. But every time there's a breach or quite a move like this, I put, I put the trade on, and I generally take it off there. At the moment, I've put on Barlow World Imperial. I've gone in a bit earlier just because Imperial got hoofed higher uh, the past week because the company announced that, yes, do you remember, we're still not going to make money. And apparently that's good news. And then they just decided to increase its valuation. Don't know why, but eventually when the actual results come out and people see it, they're going to go, oops, I'm going to sell it again. So I shorted into it and bought Barlow against it. The valuations also Barlow is much cheaper than Imperial for good reason, but it's too cheap on a relative basis. Investec over Capitec. Um, originally, I got in here and I added a bit more there. What happened is Investec had a share issue. I don't know if anyone has seen they had a share issue to pay to buy back their preference shares. Um, that knocked the share price down and they've got a dividend in them. Capitec, on the other hand, is a fantastic growth story. But people are now still projecting the same growth it had now going forward, but it's starting to change. They're starting to be in a saturated market, um, attracting the attention of the regulator. Now, once you've got attracted the attention of the regulator, they will not leave you alone. You're an easy target, and they will come after you because it justifies their existence. So I've decided to put it on. I haven't taken it on. I've traded in and out, but it's, it's moved about... Uh, 2% or something, so it hasn't done that much. Woolworths over clicks. Uh, this one has given me a hiding so far. I got involved here. I'd moved back nicely there. This is purely a valuation issue. Clicks is, as far as I, if I remember correctly, it's on a rolling historical P of about 26, 27. 
they're growing at about 13%. It's a bit expensive. And on a forward P of 24, so it's extremely expensive. Plus, they're totally locally based, a weaker currency affects their margins, etc. Willys has exposure to Australia, but I'm starting to regret that. But, but they, Willys had a massive foreign seller. And it, one big uh, foreigner who held the stock who need to liquidate because they've got a redemption on their fund. It's got nothing to do with the company. And they've been relentlessly selling it. They have to. So what does it do? It creates an opportunity. Hopefully, it does bounce back. But I've taken a bit of pain. I think that's about that's about a oof, about a ten percent move. That, by the way, um, I'm trading in and out of it and managing the position. Um, apparently, today I've got the news: the guy's out of the market. Now, previously, when I heard he's out the market, he was back two days later. But the share price did jump about four percent today, and clicks was nowhere. That's it. That's my favorite author, by the way. Anyone knows him. <laughs>